Good afternoon, welcome to the UK Column News. It is Tuesday the 24th of June 2014, it's just gone one o'clock. Myself, Louise Collins, Brian Gerrish and Mike Robinson are here in Plymouth. And today joining us is Mark Anderson over in America. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd just like to apologise for lowering standards by not having a tie on today, but I'm afraid the temperatures in the studio climbing to well above tropical outside. We've got blue sky and sunshine. We're not sure we like that, but we've assured uh, Mark Anderson that that's the normal weather for Plymouth. And being an American, he believes us, of course. Of course. We'll okay. test him on that a little bit later. Uh, well, we are going to continue the theme, really, of Wild West Britain. It's obvious that Britain is uh, becoming steadily more lawless. This is the government's plan of action. It is to reduce the country to chaos, thereby making it ungovernable. And at that stage, the draconian uh, police state legislation can be brought into play. If you don't believe us, simply uh, research the works of Saul Alinsky, the preferred activist uh, by both David Cameron's Conservative Party and the Lib Dem Party, such as still exists. And of course, uh, Ed Miliband, the Marxist and his Labour Party. So um, this is uh, really the state of play. Uh, we've got another major eviction battle going on at Yorkley uh, Court Farm in the Forest of Dean. Now, we were only informed about this last night, so um, I'm giving you the information we have at the moment. But essentially, there's a farm. Uh, over 100 years ago, the original ownership died. And uh, basically, a group called the Wilderness Group came and reclaimed the farm. And they've done a fantastic job of um, returning the land back to agricultural land. Uh, they've got horses, pigs, chickens, many vegetable gardens. Uh, they've been there for two years, often in appalling conditions, and are doing considerable market gardening. And against all expectations and the pessimism of the local council, um, they, were, they were invited by the council eventually to submit planning applications for residences who uh, the council being so impressed at what these people have done. And what's happened now that uh, the land has been brought back into use and, of course, the values increase, out of the woodwork we have the usual uh, groups appearing who are laying claim to the land with absolutely no full and proper legal documentation. So um, we've been warning and warning about this. We understand that last night uh, Gloucestershire police would not attend on site, even though there were a large number of what the um, wilderness group describe as particularly aggressive and thuggish bailiffs. Uh, we've seen this all around the country, thousands of people being dispossessed of their property by these thugs, and uh, it's now going on in the Forest of Dean. So we haven't got a further update uh, to report. I hope we'll have more detail tomorrow and hopefully some photographs. Uh, but I can tell you that at uh, quarter to 11 last night, things were particularly tense as uh, people lawfully on site were waiting for uh, a night onslaught by these bailiffs. So if you don't understand uh, how uh, out of control the court system has got, the use of falsified documents and the use of uh, criminal bailiffs in order to take people's property away, have a look at the UK column report on Guy and Linda Taylor. I mean, these bailiffs, I just don't know how they can even just go home and look their families in the eye after the things that they do and what they're putting other families through. What kind of people are they? They're very basic people. And if you want to be kind to them, you say many of them are not going to be bright enough to actually understand yeah, what they're doing. Possible. They need a job. They've got families to feed. So they just get out there and do what they're told. <laughs> what they don't realise, of course, is this is the very action mm -hmm. that ultimately introduces the police state. Their own families will yeah. suffer. Yeah. So there we are. Meanwhile, land is being, sorry, land is being taken. And meanwhile, we've got the government, of course, simply giving away the NHS. NHS exactly, yeah. Um, Dr. Mark Porter, who is the chair of council for the BMA, has said that the NHS has been served up to armies of lawyers and accountants from the private sector. He was speaking at the BMA annual conference. He said that pressure to tender NHS contracts to as many potential providers as possible has led to market lunacy. Apparently, one case had no fewer than 500 
potential providers for providing NHS services. And one of them was actually an American private health firm, which was run by nuns. Um, there was a case uh, in Bedfordshire and Milton Keynes that's going on at the moment that's costing around £3 million, according to the BMA. And uh, two clinical commissioning groups involved have written to no fewer than 500 potential providers asking if they wish to provide um, an, exp um, an interest in running the NHS services. So it's basically going out to tender all over the world and um, a lot of interest from American healthcare. But I started having a look, little look around the net today to see what's been sold off so yeah, far by the NHS. So um, here we are. I mean, it's, it, these are figures from uh, 2013. So we've got GP surgeries, out of hours, walk-in centres, diagnostic services, domiciliary care, um, podiatry, community services, prison health, ambulance service, mental health services. We know childcare now is um, and child health services are now involved in that. As we get down here, I think Virgin have taken control of children's services down here and uh, compared to the uh, list back in 1989 where it was just one so this this is this is david cameron's conservative policy where he said he's not going to sell off the nhs no. but unfortunately he is selling off the nhs and has done so and has done so david cameron of course lying to the nation and uh, it's easy to understand why conservative central office was so keen to wipe all of the pre-election data from the Conservative websites because it would just be too obvious to people that uh, we've, we've basically got a liar yeah. as Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom. Well, if we're under attack, uh, people overseas certainly under attack. And uh, as we always say, if you're of a weak disposition, turn away now. Yeah, from one liar to uh, another. Um, retired diplomats have signed a letter calling for the sacking of Tony Blair as Middle East peace envoy. Uh, they include Sir Richard Dalton, who was Iran's ambassador when Blair was prime minister, Oliver Miles, who was ambassador to Libya, and Christopher Lang, who was former Egyptian ambassador. The letters came in response to George Galloway's fourth coming film, The Killing of Tony Blair. Uh, a response from Blair's spokesman via The Guardian said, these are all people, uh, I can't pronounce this, vis viscerally opposed to Tony Blair Viscerally. with absolutely no credibility in relation to him whatsoever. Their attack is neither surprising or newsworthy. They include the alliance of hard right and hard left views, which he has fought against all of his political life. And uh, I think we've got another slide to go up. We've well, we we'll just comment on that. Slide, Isn't yeah. it incredible that Tony Blair is still walking free on the planet? Uh, of course, if his name was um, uh, Brian Gerrish, a sad, uh, well, maybe Brian Gerrish even. <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll wait and see what happens over that. But this man's still walking free. Why is he walking free? Because all of us have not done enough to get this man into uh, a proper court of law for the immense suffering that he's caused uh, in Iraq in a particular. But uh, unless people like this are dealt with in a proper way, we often say an appropriate, cuddly way, um, they are going to cause more and more damage. But if you just bring that one back up, Mike. Um, we had a look at the little slide here on the, on the right where we, we talked about Russell Brand in the past, haven't we? And that this whole revolution is just a part of it. Call him for calling for a revolution is part of a big distraction. And uh, we noticed this picture. And then I investigated the tattoo. Uh, here we are. And there it is. Well, we don't what know does what it all the, mean. We don't know what the meaning of this is, but it's interesting. It's a sort of Christ-like figure calling for revolution. And this is the man, of course, favoured by the mainstream media to tell us that we need change in this country. I'm going to say my personal opinion is what we're really looking at here is uh, a sort of um, embedded reset agenda. The last thing we need in this country is revolution. What we need is, is uh, peace and stability uh, to get these criminals in uh, Westminster and those in the international banking system brought to book. But you've got some more on this uh, wonderful subject of uh, Tony. Uh, Mike, yes, I think. Uh, yes, because uh, as we pointed out a few days ago, Tony Blair uh, had written his excuses uh, about uh, Iraq, denying that he had anything to do with what's going on in Iraq today. Uh, and of course, he received a fair amount of criticism for that. But rather than just letting sleeping dogs lie, he had to have yet another uh, bite back. And, and he did this in the Financial Times uh, 
yesterday or the day before. Uh, removing Saddam Hussein did not cause the crisis. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight uh, one particular quote from that. We cannot ignore the facts, sorry, the fact that ISIS, the jihadist group advancing across Iraq, rebuilt itself and organized the Iraq operation from the chaos in Syria. ISIS and other Al-Qaeda type groups in Iraq were flat on their back four years ago, having been comprehensively beaten by a combination of US and UK forces and Sunni tribes. Uh, the civil war in Syria allowed them to get back on their feet. And uh, and I'm just thinking, well, that's that's a pretty magical thing for them to have done. They all by themselves, they've managed to arm themselves, they've managed to organise themselves into a, into a cohesive force, and they've managed to uh, move from Syria into Iraq uh, without any support whatsoever. And it has nothing to do with uh, with anything other than just the fact that, that we didn't continue to follow through in Syria. Um, well, um, let's just uh, consider this because, of course, um, as uh, has been pointed out, um, we have an increasing number of people being radicalised in the United Kingdom and appearing over in Syria and Iraq uh, and uh, a couple of MPs uh, talking about this. Uh, let's not forget uh, the uh, money which has apparently been uh, hidden within uh, well, what appears to be fraud uh, as a result of various arms deals in the past. And of course, Tony Blair himself was responsible for having this particular investigation um, shut down. And we know that Saudi Arabia is financing um, uh, elements within Syria. Has, uh, is there a guarantee here that none of that money has ended up in the hands of uh, ISIS? None of the arms that have been bought have been, uh, I don't think anybody can make that guarantee. Uh, and of course, it's not just uh, the British aerospace fraud, because there's another alleged fraud involving Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, we've got direct uh, links between Prince Bandar and the United Kingdom and the British royal family as well. Um, so we cannot... Uh, just assume that, that ISIS has appeared out of nowhere as if by magic. It has been financed, it has been organised, it's been supported. Um, and, uh, and I would suggest that the links uh, via Saudi Arabia come right back uh, to, to Britain's door and possibly even to the door of uh, Tony Blair or his friends. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, highlight the, the comments of, uh, this, of Gunter Meyer, who's from the uh, Centre of Research into the Arabic World at uh, University of Mainz in Germany who says uh, the most important source of ISIS financing to date has been support coming out of the Gulf states, primarily Saudi Arabia, but also Qatar, Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. And of course, this is a point that Patrick Henningsen has been making on this programme for many, many months. Um, and uh, um, as I say, uh, we can't ignore the connections back to the British arms establishment uh, and the uh, allegations of fraud uh, and funneling of money into back channels uh, via that fraudulent activity. Would it be appropriate to bring uh, Mark in here? Uh, Mike, I think. Yeah, I think so. Have we still got you, Mark? I am with you. Did, did you manage to hear that report on uh, uh, Tony Blair? Yes, I did. And especially the ISIS comments you guys were just making. I would note, for what it's worth, it's a little early to make all these connections, but the new infrastructure of the Middle East was one of the Bilderberg topics this year in Denmark. And I'm beginning to look into just exactly what they mean by the new infrastructure of the Middle East. And uh, certainly this ISIS thing and the funding and background of that uh, bears close scrutiny and deserves it very much. And I'm among those that's doing that right now. And um, Rand Paul, of course, the, the kind of retrograde senator from Kentucky, just commented that the U.S. is implicated in funding ISIS uh, behind the scenes. And there's, of course, concerns by myself and other observers that because it, it, it translates into Syria, that this will end up being a backdoor for America to topple Assad in Syria uh, rather than trying to go through the front door, and that this whole thing is being contrived to get at Syria, at least in part. And that, of course, would dovetail with the fact that Israel just made airstrikes inside of Syria uh, very recently. And so uh, there's a lot that can come out of this, and there's a lot to investigate, but it's it's pretty explosive stuff, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah well, my, uh, for, for, for me, Mark, Mike's point that uh, these, um, these groups don't just sort of come out of nowhere, they've got to be properly funded. In fact, I believe everything is created, in, including the ideology itself. Uh, but just... Um, 
remarkable to watch uh, Mr Blair suggest that, of course, we've got violence as not as a result of not unleashing enough violence in another country, Syria. So we, we can just see that these are the people that if they're let loose to walk upon the earth, they are going to constantly be creating wars and violence until they're, they're brought to heel. And uh, for our uh, British audience today, uh, it's up to good people in this country to start to bring these people to book uh, before they unleash uh, yet more wars, whether that's going to come in Ukraine and uh, Eastern Europe or not. We, we have to wait to see. Uh, but, Mark, I believe you've, um, you've got some documents of interest uh, which you'd like to um, talk us through. Um, how should we play it? Should we bring this one up on screen and then you can uh, tell us what this is actually about? Uh, yeah, I, I may not be seeing everything you're seeing. Um, is that the Texas document? It is yes, indeed. It is. This is Colonel Steve um, McCraw, director, um, and it's a document dated June the 18th, 2014. The Texas uh, yeah. border. Yeah, uh, this was actually a letter from Governor Rick Perry and uh, two associates to Colonel McGraw, who heads the Texas Department of Public Safety, which is basically the state police and the Texas Rangers. And the human and drug trafficking is getting so bad at the border, uh, particularly the border with Texas uh, at Mexico, that children by themselves are coming across without any per parents or without any supervisors or, or uh, elders with them. Uh, they're, uh, the, the, the United States government is being accused by Texas of simply not doing its job to secure the border, and Texas is having to take things into its own hands. And this letter is an order from the governor to Colonel McGraw that Texas will, in fact, do that and will, in fact, take responsibility for protecting the border. And yet, yeah, to the extent that the U.S. Border Patrol will cooperate, they'll work with the Border Patrol, but essentially Texas is saying we're going to have to act like a separate nation now, at least to some extent, and we're going to have to protect our own border because the federal government, which is so in bed with international finance and so intent on pumping these free trade deals, therefore the federal government just isn't doing it. And so we have, you know, unsupervised children crossing the border as part of child trafficking. Um, you know, and, and huge amounts of cartel drug trafficking. Uh, Texas is, is coming under assault. There are increased home invasions. There are increased crimes of various kinds. And so, yeah, Rick Perry, Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst, and the Speaker of the Texas House, Joe Strauss, are, are, telling, are telling McGraw that we've got to do this ourselves. And, of course, this ultimately is because of, of the NAFTA trade deal and other factors that have made life so much more difficult in Mexico and Central America that it creates the very flood of people that Texas is trying to stop. And then that flood of people is exploited by the drug cartels uh, for drug and human trafficking, including child trafficking. And this is what you have. The states are having to act on their own. And Oh, sorry, no, we've, we've got a story coming up about the trafficking, which I've sent over to Mark, uh, Mark earlier, so we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more in a bit. OK, I was, I was just going to ask, um, Mark, in your opinion, um, what, what is actually going on here? America, uh, like any other major nation state, uh, used to be fully in control of its borders. That's an inherent part of the security of a nation state. Uh, what do you think it is that uh, that has uh, caused this uh, state, the present state of affairs, where America doesn't seem to be in control of its uh, southern border at all? What, what's actually going on? Well, I think part of it is the kind of lingering efforts by the global elite to form a North American Union, whereby the borders of U.S., Mexico and Canada would be treated as mere curiosities if they have any reality at all. You know, the idea that you can just mix people together uh, at whim and just throw them in a blender and push the on button, I think is part of the global agenda to uh, deplete and diminish the individual cultures of those three nations. 
by having unrestrained migration across the borders, particularly the U.S. southern border with Mexico. And I think NAFTA was calculated to create a injured economy south of the Rio Grande River and thereby create this mass migration that then would be managed um, or mismanaged, you might say. In other words, to create chaos in the way you were saying earlier, Brian, about a certain interests that are creating chaos there in the British Isles. There's there's sort of a modus operandi into creating chaos because out of that, a, a different kind of structure can arise. I think the, those are the ultimate causes. You also have other things where you have pressure groups that are, you know, that believe in open borders without restraint. Uh, they have no problem with Mexican citizens coming here and voting in U.S. elections, even though they're not even U.S. citizens. Um, you have a lot of the liberal pressure groups, and, you know, some of that kind of degenerates into left-wing, right-wing, you know, ping-pong matches. But it, ultimately, it's it's the North American Union managers and the NAFTA accord that are behind creating this chaos. And uh, uh, the drug cartels get right in there and they exploit, they get part of the action, you might say, a piece of the pie. And, and then this is what we have, where states like Texas are having to guard their own borders. And um, we can only hope that uh, the U.S. government will realize that it's you're not being racist if you protect your borders. You're not being uh, ethnocentric or anything like that. It, you're not being a white supremacist. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with protecting your borders. In fact, more secure U.S. borders would be in the interests of the migrants that are trying to come here. Because right now, the drug cartels are, um, you know, getting in on it. And that creates more dangers for those Mexicans and Central Americans that are trying to come to the U.S. So tighter border security ultimately is in the interest of everyone. Well, this, that's a really uh, very important point, Mark, because, um, of course, at the end of the day, it's not uh, the fault of the people who are making the migration. They, they are being used as, uh, as uh, cannon fodder, basically. They're being used to carry out a political agenda and they're suffering in the process. So that's uh, right. what's being done hurts everybody. And this is not to do with... Uh, uh, ethnicity or uh, color or or actual or, or country of origin. This is to do with political manipulation of the movement of uh, thousands, millions of people. It's very calculated, very cynical. Um, we have had um, reports that um, there's there's been some investigation into the findings of the bodies of children uh, down in the border area. Are you aware of this at all, or can you tell us anything more about it? Yes, I can. Uh, in Falfurious. Now, that's a town where I've spent some time in South Texas. It's a small town where there's a U.S. Border Patrol checkpoint, and they just found some mass graves there, thought to be men and women and apparently children uh, of illegal immigrants, which, who I call un unregulated migrants. The word immigrant connotes a legal sanction. What they are is unregulated migrants. That's the proper terminology. And they were found buried in makeshift graves in this South Texas town of Falfurious very recently. And this, no doubt, is part of the reason Governor Perry in Texas is getting the Texas authorities to crack down to cut back on the murder and sexual assault and extortion and child prostitution and home invasions and other crimes that are rising in Texas because of the unregulated migration. And so, yeah, there's been graves in that small town uh, of Falfurious uh, in South Texas that, that were found. Wow. I've, um, just, I've just got one more question, if, if I may, and that is that, of course, America, for us anyway, is a vast country. Um, do people um, at distance from those uh, border areas, uh, do other Americans understand what's actually starting to go on in uh, America's southern border, border region? Um, to a limited extent, one of the things that can or at least should wake up Americans that live more inland is the fact that the drug cartels are very sophisticated operations. Many of them have former intel and former military in them, soldier of fortune types. They have 
a lot of resources at their fingertips and they commit a lot of crimes and have a lot of connections in the inside states like Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, uh, not near any borders. And so to the extent that police publicize these things and the media publicize these things, then Americans that don't live by the border can say, wow, you know, the, the cartels are making inroads into Kansas and Nebraska. This isn't just a Texas thing and or a California or Arizona thing. And so to that extent, yes, but I still perceive, I think, accurately that too many that don't live in a border state don't fully appreciate what's going on. And even Texas being such a huge state itself, those that live, say, Dallas, whatnot, maybe don't fully comprehend. But I spend a lot of time uh, near the border and uh, I see this stuff firsthand. And uh, yeah, you have police officers who are found beheaded, um, honest military people, 12, 14 at a time, found decapitated. Um, it, it's really something. And um, the U.S. federal government plays a big role in not enforcing proper border laws. And in fact, the last thing I'll mention, or, or another thing I'll mention, I should say, is that the immigration reform legislation was passed by the Senate a year ago, but the House still has not acted on it. It's not a very good bill, but they could have spent their time making a better bill. And in fact, they've just been sitting on a rather lackluster bill and nothing's been done. Yeah, well, somebody said in the chat box, total chaos everywhere. Uh, Mark, we've got another slide up now um, of yours, um, the group of 77. Do you want to uh, talk us through this one, please? Well, this is a pretty new item on my plate. Uh, to some extent, I hesitated on getting into it too much. But what I understand is that in Bolivia recently, the group of 77 being, you know, a good portion of the nations of the world, roughly two thirds or whatever it is, uh, they, they recently met in Bolivia, and reportedly, these are kind of preliminary indications, the group of 77 nations, and I think I sent you a link on uh, uh, the group of 77 that lists who they are, are, are supposedly, it, it appears that they're rebelling to some extent against the G7, G8, G20, and, and those groupings that are represented by the the Bilderberg nations and the trilateral nations and the, you know, EU and whatnot. It says here on, on a link at a blog called AmericanOutrage.us, it says 133 uh, uh, countries have had enough of the New World Order's rigged global financial system based in New York and London. They've seen their economies destroyed by corrupt corporations and global governments that create a never-ending cycle of dependence and poverty. They've seen vast resources stolen by multinational corporations. Their agricultural landscape has been poisoned. And basically, it appears the Group of 77 is, 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 um, is part of this apparent movement um, to sort of resist the G20 and G8 and G7 uh, it, it to, to be kind of a countervailing force, you might say. I'm still investigating it, but um, it, it appears that it, it sort of builds on the BRICS nations that we've heard about, Britain, Russia, India, China, South Africa, in being kind of a counterweight to, um, to, to these other groupings, these pro-Western groupings of which Bilderberg is you know, connected. And so it's a little bit preliminary, but it's it's pretty curious that apparently this meeting happened in Bolivia. And, you know, it happens right as Argentina was trying to get out from under the claws of a hedge fund. And, and that, of course, is a case where we're learning that the financial oligarchs are genuinely in charge. Uh, if, if you can draw one thing from the Argentine example, if you can draw even one lesson from it, it appears that the, the financial oligarchs truly, not just the central bankers, but hedge fund managers are literally in charge of what's going on and are getting what looks like preferential treatment in the courts. And so um, if this group of 77 resistance is for real, it represents something pretty profound. But uh, I'm still looking into it. But uh, so far, it appears to have some truth to it. Thanks, Mark. Um, 
Brian, I think you're going to off you go with the veterans. Well, this is uh, something that was uh, flagged up to us over the last couple of days, and it didn't receive a great deal of uh, mainstream coverage, so we thought we'd bring it up. But uh, a lot of uh, veterans got uh, very, very upset uh, when um, Stan Collymore from um, uh, Talk Sport came up with this uh, tweet, uh, Falklands. Um, and basically, what he's saying is... Um, I believe it's an effing island with sheep. So it was a very derogatory uh, tweet that came out of this this man. And there's been a big black backlash amongst the uh, veterans. And uh, people have been asking for apologies. Well, of course, remember that Talk Sport is owned by UTV Media. They've been suffering, um, seeing their pre-tax profits plummet by almost 60%. Um, so, uh, yeah, we just wanted to say we recognise that there's a lot of veterans deeply upset with uh, this man's pretty offences, offensive comments. And um, it's going to be interesting to see what uh, what TalkSport does, if anything, to censor him for what he what he did. If anybody else has got any more information on that, we'll happily take it. We, of course, have been interested in TalkSport as being a station which used to put out quite a lot of good information warning about the dangers of the European Union and then almost yeah. overnight it went very, very quiet. And of course, TalkSport was uh, one of the many uh, quasi-mainstream channels that didn't want to talk at all about uh, political charity common purpose. So make of that what you will. Um, but this is a bit more straightforward. Um, Infowars and Alex Jones has been uh, warning and warning about the increasing restrictions on alternative media, telling the truth about what's going on, not only in the States, but the world. And uh, here he is saying that uh, Hillary Clinton is now calling for harsh restrictions on alternative media. And of course, Alec Jones has already been blocked from broadcasting to the US military. So we say our oh, Alex's warnings valid for, um, sorry, that should be press and media censorship in UK. And uh, we're, we think the overwhelming answer is yes. UK column predicts that we are going to see in the coming days, the first attempt by uh, the UK system to actually censor uh, any form of alternative news and media. And of course, that uh, is unbelievably, uh, unbelievably dangerous in where it leads us. And we're going to thank Nick for sending us this information through. Now, we don't apologise for putting this up once again. We're saying to people, don't believe us, do your own research. But here's the government's communication service. Uh, when we are at our best, government communication already is exceptional. We have a deserved reputation for innovation. Uh, that's telling lies, presumably, and a growing track record in evaluation and we are now recognised by the Civil Service Board as a key profession and an exemplar of civil service reform. So this is modern propaganda. This is how it's put together. Uh, it's all going to be under the government's communication service. So do have a look at this, a new governance structure. We're going to bring all communications up to the standard of the best. Uh, we're going to have pref uh, professional career development. And there's the magic word. We're going to have collaboration, key word from Saul Alinsky. And uh, do go and have a look at these, um, uh, these sections within the GCS. Uh, we decided to go and have a little uh, rake around in the local and regional uh, communication capability review. Uh, well, what did we find? Uh, I've, sorry, I've got a ring come up there a little bit early. We'll see that in a second. Uh, how can governments make sure its messages, and in particular its core narrative, is relevant to people's everyday lives? What they are talking about is controlling the way people think. And we are now starting to see this massive um, elephant they've put together to do it. Now, we were interested down at the bottom that there were a couple of companies who were clearly uh, involved with the government communications service. Uh, this is one, Liz Lewis-Jones, chief executive of Liquid, and there was also a Rob Brown managing partner at Rule 5. Um, well, we went to the website and uh, now we can see what that uh, little yellow circle <coughs> is because there is Liz. And so this is a private creative communication company 
and we were absolutely fascinated to know what uh, uh, this lady's role was with G GCS. So we sent her an email and asked her, what is your role? And are you in a contractual re relationship with the government? And uh, in the exchange of email, she says this. Hello, Brian. I was a reviewer last December. The work was undertaken in my own time and done pro bono uh, for free. As mentioned previously, I, Liquid, have no contract with the GCS. So I gave six, time, six days of my time to help. So our question is, why would somebody be giving free help to the government? And if it was free, was there no contract in place at all? And if there was no contract in place, then presumably there was no tendering process for the role. So our question is, and at the moment it's remained unanswered, is how did the communica creative communication company uh, Liquid actually get the role? Mm. And what is the role? Well, we're going to be asking the government's communication service, but if any of our viewers and listeners uh, want to assist the process in a polite <coughs> way, of course, uh, what is this organisation about? And uh, we already know that uh, GCS is involved in the government's applied behavioural change. So this to us seems to be a propaganda, propaganda machine designed to get down to the Definitely. lowest level. Well, news on um, those who dare to interfere with the truth. Yeah. Mr Coulson. Mr Coulson and Rebecca Brooks, it literally broke for a couple of minutes before we were due to come, air, come on air. Uh, Andy Coulson has been found guilty and is now facing jail for phone hacking whilst at the News of the World. Coulson apparently stood emotionless after hearing the verdict. Uh, the Guardian are now asking questions of David Cameron, who hired Coulson as uh, Director of Communications a few weeks after he quit the News of the World. Coulson has spent the last seven years denying he knew about the hacking, but uh, Rebecca Brooks and her husband were cleared of all four charges they were up against. And uh, that's all I got, really, just before we came on. It literally broke. So, cleared um, of all... Your thoughts? Cleared of all charges. Well, they had to sacrifice somebody, otherwise the public simply wouldn't believe the thing was real. So it looks to me like... I'm going to say poor Mr. Coulson yeah. was the sacrificial lamb. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of them carry on as normal uh, because presumably they are too rich, powerful and above the law. Uh, but then we could also say, um, was Rebecca Brooks a little bit too well informed at the high level paedophile rings in Britain? Remember, a few years ago, she actually helped lead a campaign to expose paedophile rings in Britain. And certainly many people on the streets think that perhaps she got a little bit too close to the senior people for, com for comfort. She therefore, got too close to Cameron as well, um, by rumours. Therefore, she's been uh, protected. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Well, um, the Telegraph is not impressed at the way things are going to do with censorship of the media in UK. Uh, this is quite extraordinary because John McTurnan uh, was a political secretary to Tony Blair. And uh, recently he's been director of communications to the Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. So he moves around the world from, from one big celeb to the next, as you do. Uh, but in his, in his article, which I'd encourage people to go and read, uh, he's um, singled out, hacked off. He initially starts talking about uh, problems in Egypt and the fact that reporters reporting on the terrible situation in Egypt have ended up in prison. But in the middle of that um, text, he starts to talk about uh, Hacked Off. And he says the case against Hacked Off is simply put, it wants to use the excesses of the news of the world to create a system that would gag independent journalists and prevent papers from investigating and exposing scandalous behaviour by figures in the public eye. Um, for Hacked Off, this is a moral crusade about the right to privacy in the face of illegal actions by journalists. But that last word is surely the point. It is already illegal to hack phones and it's against the law for police officers to sell confidential information to newspapers. So he's saying quite rightly the laws are already in place. But then let's have a look at the last piece. It's easy to see why politicians would want to have the press either censored or better still censoring itself in fear of an external regulator. The chilling effect would be felt most fiercely at the local level in the reporting of the councils where some of the most dodgy behaviour occurs. Imagine how careful junior reporters on small papers would feel 
they had to be. Yeah. So he's really going back in the face of the, of the government and uh, warning that there is something very nasty coming under Leveson. Before I put this into context, perhaps with a bit of an example, um, should we ask um, Mr. Anderson if he'd like to comment? What are you seeing to do with censorship in the States? Well, the, in the States, the battle mainly centers around the big media organs being owned by only six entities, roughly. The concentration of ownership is the overriding problem. Um, I think it varies a lot here. There's so many independent papers and small weeklies and small dailies in addition to the larger media organs. Um, but I think that we're making inroads through American Free Press and with the UK column um, and other entities, WHDT, the next news network out of uh, Aurora, Illinois. There's a lot of effort going on to build the independent press. And I think that right now here in the States, we're a little bit ahead of the curve, despite what Hillary Clinton is bloviating about. Uh, I can't believe people even take her or her husband seriously. That's the big story. And I think there's a lot of progress being made to build an independent media here. And, and I think we're making a lot of headway. I know of an, an independent station that just gained a lot more TV viewers in the Boston, Massachusetts area, uh, telling them a much more truthful narrative of what's going on in the world. So there's, there's actually some good news here in the States of a lot of efforts to build and expand the independent media and to network. But the concentration of ownership is the, is the main thing uh, through the Federal Communications uh, Commission. And, uh, you know, fighting that and getting a more diversified ownership is the ongoing battle here. Yeah. I think th those are the key things. Uh, well, I would certainly agree with that. Um, well, if I just put up now a diagram we've shown many times before, I'm not going to dwell on it too long, but this is the spider's web of people that have been attempting to get state control of the media. Um, over on the right, of course, we've got uh, Hacked Off, which the Telegraph article was talking about. So we had the Hacked Off campaign um, uh, lobbying and pushing and screaming for the fact that something had to be done to control the press. Uh, but of course, who was in the background? Well, Sir David Bell and uh, Julia Middleton, they were both involved with the, with the uh, political charity Common Purpose. They were a powerhouse of the drive for, to state control of the media. And where did they come from? Well, they don't want to tell us which of the international banks were funding them. Uh, but of course, Common Purpose has been waxing lyrical about how great the banks are. Lehman Brothers was supposedly a brilliant leadership example for school children. Deutsche Bank has clearly put money in, but the remainder they don't want to tell us. Uh, but what I've also put there is links through to um, Marxist uh, organisation Demos. Well, this is the other bit. This is where it can take us. Uh, we pointed out that um, poor old Robert Green campaigning um, against child abuse in Scotland, justice for Holly Gregg, ends up in prison. He's still under house arrest in England at the moment. Um, and uh, we were told a few days ago that NewsQuest had put an internal block on its websites uh, to prevent its staff from getting to Robert's free Robert Green uh, site. And uh, we'd also pointed out that Levy McRae, very, very powerful Scottish law firm, uh, deeply involved in the uh, Holly Gregg case with Dame Eilish Angelini. They were also advising NewsQuest. So this is the little area we're interested in. Uh, well, we thought we'd better put up because um, this is actually a photograph taken of the, uh, of the internal um, NewsQuest um, intranet. And here you see that a search has been done for freerobertgreen.co.uk and up has come the message denied. Uh, let's make it obvious this is the bit we're looking at. There's the NewsQuest Media Group and access denied. Now we're reliably told from multiple sources uh, that this occurs at different locations, different geographic locations from the NewsQuest uh, Media Group. So we're not too sure what's going on here, but it would appear that there's some form of internal censorship 
on uh, on Robert Green and the Holly Gregg case. Um, is this in the public interest? Well, we certainly think it's in the public interest if we've got massive news groups working to prevent their own staff from reading uh, material. Uh, we actually got in contact with the NewsQuest chief executive uh, this morning and we asked him to explain why the free Robert Green website had been blocked. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we got an email back from uh, a gentleman called Tim Blot, the managing director of the Herald and Times group up in Glasgow. So very quickly, the problem moved north of the border. Uh, Mr. Blot was extremely helpful, uh, but a little bit confused because he thought we were making a complaint, which we weren't. We were simply asking for clarification. Uh, so before we came on air, uh, we sent another email in which we said, uh, can he confirm that NewsQuest has blocked NewsQuest staff from accessing the website Free Robert Green, which is campaigning to stop child abuse? Um, if such a block exists, can he please explain why this action has been taken? And if such blocking action has been taken, uh, can they confirm that uh, the access denied restrictions on NewsQuest staff has been taken in connection with advice NewsQuest has received from law firm Levy and McRae, who we understand list NewsQuest as a client, as one of their many clients. So that's been sent off at 11.46 today, and we wait with great interest to uh, see what comes back. Um, pretty amazing, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it, Jeff? Well, Russia Today is on the yep. subject to children. This is, uh, this is one for Mark, actually. 168 children were rescued and 281 people arrested in a week-long operation in America this week. The FBI's uh, Innocent Lost program was set up back in 2003 and, according to the FBI, has resulted in the rescue of 3,600 children and 1,450 convictions, 14 life prison terms and the seizure of uh, $3.1 million. The latest operation named Operation Cross Country has shown that children are being targeted and sold for sex across America every single day. And uh, Mark, I'd like your uh, comments on this, please. Fairly short. Yeah, quickly, because we're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, without having the... Um time to look into that article in depth right at the moment i would think that some of those children are probably from other nations and due to the porous borders and due to the uh, child trafficking i discussed earlier across the texas border without looking at it i would think that some of them have been caught in that in that system uh, that being said these things have been going on uh, a long time in the states ted gunderson a late fbi agent that i spoke to a number of times said that even satanic cults and people involved in occult type activities are involved in kidnappings and child traffickings and that it can get downright dirty and nasty. And uh, since time is tight, I'll leave it at that. But I'm going to look into that one more and see the composition of these children and look at it a little more closely. But it fits in with the things that I've experienced and what I discussed earlier today. I, I found it because it's just it's just happening. It isn't just in this country that's going on. It is going on a global scale. So yeah. it'd be nice to hook up more with Mark and, and discuss this more and see exactly what scale okay. is going on both well, sides. Well, we think we might be we're going to end here on what could be good news. We're going to watch it very closely. But yeah. over to you, okay. Zara. So according to Zara, the number of MPs who are now wanting an inquiry into organised sexual abuse of children has now passed the hundred mark. According to Zara, uh, cameras told MPs that he was looking at ordering an inquiry uh, so apparently the numbers actually reached 104 Tim Loughton last week spoke in Parliament to press for an inquiry he also asked uh, Andrew Lanzi for a debate in Parliament but here's a bit of good news somebody from the British Constitution Group wrote to Zach Goldsmith congratulating Zach Goldsmith Goldsmith, uh, Goldsmith yet yeah, for uh, standing up bearing in mind Goldsmith is related to the Rothschilds, but anyway, yeah, so he, um, we, they wrote, they congratulated, and this was the response. Uh, thank you for your email. email. I remember the appalling case of Holly Gregg on the border issues. There are clearly an urgent need to establish a properly resourced, independent Hillsborough-style inquiry that victims can have faith in. 
I have been approached by many people recently about their own personal accounts of abuse and although I am not qualified to help people individually and nor would I have the capacity to do so, I will do absolutely everything I can to ensure this inquiry happens so that these types of stories can be heard. Best wishes, Zach Goldsmith. Well, well, there you go. OK, well, we're going to watch that very closely. Yeah. What, we're, what we'd like to say to viewers and listeners, it's not enough to watch. It's not enough to listen. Uh, we need people to take action. And even if you can only send one email a day, starting to put the pressure on politicians and also to encourage uh, maybe politicians who are starting to go in the right direction, we need to do it and we need to do it very quickly. Indeed. Uh, we got an announcement for tonight, I oh, think, Oh, yes. Mike. Fracking is on tonight. Not fracking. Health Revolution with Clive. Yeah, the Health Revolution is on tonight. Clive would like uh, to do a kind of a question and answer session. So if anybody has questions for him, um, please uh, send those to me at editor at ukcolumn.org and I'll pass those along to Clive for tonight. So questions for Health Revolution tonight at 9pm. That was editor at ukcolumn.org if nobody understood the accent there. OK. And uh, Mark, we'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again. And uh, it's just uh, it's just great to be linking up across the vast distance of the Atlantic because we need uh, good people to work together wherever they are in the world. So thanks for joining us again. Thank you're you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks, OK. Mark. Well, the temperature in the studio is clearly well over 100, so we're <coughs> going to sign off. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye. Bye-bye.